In the last tutorial about netcode for game objects, we set up the network manager and made client authoritative movement for the players. This time, we'll be spawning some enemies on the server, we'll also add network variable for player score and make server authoritative movement to protect our game from cheaters. The way that we have set up the enemy spawner now would mean that on each of the players we would have a different enemy spawner, so the enemies would really not be syncing well. For this reason it is the best to always spawn your objects on the server. And as we only want to be able to run this script on the server, we need to add the network objects component to it, and we can jump to the enemy spawner script. I edit using unity.netcode so that we can inherit from network behavior, so that we can override the on network spawn void. Here we are just going to check if the enemy spawner script is running on a server, if it isn't we will just disable it. So this script is only going to run on the server and pretty much always when you are converting your mono behavior to network behavior, you should move all your code from the start void to the on network spawn. As soon as I start the game we can see the enemies are spawning on the host which is also acting as the server but on the other client, no enemies are spawning, which is what we want. And now we'll also make sure that the enemies are synchronized across all of the clients. I will select the enemy prefab and I'm going to add the network object component to it as well, because it is part of the network, and we'll add network transform. You can see at this time we are not adding client network transform, because only the server will be moving the enemies, so it can be network transform which is only server authoritative. And we only need to sync in the Y and X position, just like that. But in the game you could have seen that the enemies were not even spawning on the second client. This is because we need to spawn it using the network object. So in the code we are correctly instantiating the enemy, but this is happening only on the server. So we need to get the network object component from it and just call the function spawn. So all of the objects that we are instantiating should be instantiated on the server but then you also need to grab the network object from it and call the spawn function so that it spawns on all of the clients as well. And I'm just saying that I want to destroy it with the scene. We can see that the enemies are correctly spawning at the server as well as the client and the movement is synchronized. But when I select the enemies, you can see that the enemy AI script is still running on them even though it is on the client so we'll make sure that the script for the enemies is running only on the server. So the enemy class is again inheriting from the network behavior, so that on network spawn, if it is not server, we can just disable it, and I will also move all of that stuff from the start to the on network spawn as well. The enemy is always trying to follow the closest player. Till now we have had just one player, so it was really easy to just find the player object. But as we have multiple players, on the enemy spawner I will be storing a list of all of the players and then the enemy will decide which player is the closest one. We have a list for all of the players, and even though we could be still assigning them on update, it would not really be performant, so I will just assign them once player connects or disconnects the game. So we have those two functions, soon you will see why they need to take in you long, and this is certainly not the most effective way to get all of the players, but it works for now. I also had to add using system.threading.tasks so that in this async function I can just skip one frame because when I was trying to get the players as soon as the player disconnected it was giving me some errors. Now how do we know that a player has connected or disconnected? We can get this from the network manager. To access the network manager it is really simple, just type network manager and we can access the singleton and you can see that we have a bunch of useful information that we can get from it but we need to get the on client connected callback and the disconnected one. So to these callbacks we can just assign our functions and you can see the callback has a action that needs inputs of you long so that's why we need to add it here to match the signature. So when some player either connects or disconnects from our game it should refresh list without players. So as we have zero players the list is obviously empty, I will join as a host Take a look at the list, so we have one player in, and when I join in with the second player, yep, we can see that we have two players in the list, and if I disconnect with this one, yep, we can see that there is only one. We are still getting some errors, but this is only related to the enemies. You can see it on the enemies that are running on the client, they are also kind of rotated weirdly, 
which is because they have the Gnomesh agent component on them. So when we are running all of the logic on the server, we can just disable these components and it should fix this issue. So in the enemy script, if it is not running on the server, we can just disable the Gnomesh agent component. So in the host, it is still all working well, we can join as the client, and yep, we can see the weird rotation is no longer happening. But the enemies are still not following the closest player, so let's fix that. So in the enemy script, we no longer want to be assigning the players like this manually, we want to do it in update. So from start, the player will be equal to now. If this is true, then we can just go to the enemy spawner, cycle through the list of the players and just choose the one that is closest to the enemy. This is just some logic that is not really specific to the netcode per game objects, it is just trying to find the closest player. And to make sure that we are not getting any new reference exception errors, we will make sure that once any of the players disconnect, we just set the player to null so that it can choose a new player from the list. Again, I am accessing the network manager singleton, so when the client disconnects, it is going to set the player to null so that it can again search for the player that is closest to the enemy. And I just forgot that I already had the void update in here, so I will just copy this one function and run it in the update that we have added just now. So I'm running on the host, we can see that the enemy seems to be following the closest player, which there is currently just one. So we can start as a client and just try walking into the enemies, and we can see that some of them are also following this player, which currently is closer, so I can try to just drag them, it's not really working, but we can see that the enemies are certainly following the closest player. The key thing that we did here is that the logic of the enemies as well as the spawning is running on the server, so there is pretty much no way for the cheaters to either spawn some enemies or to make them disappear. But one issue with the enemies now is that because the logic is not running on the client, the client can't really damage the enemies. So what we'll need to do is to run the player's attacking logic on the server as well. There is one useful term that will allow us to do that, as well as to make server authoritative player movement. And the term is server RPC, and there is also client RPC. Server RPC means that a client wants to run some code on the server. So it is just going to say, hey server, please run this code for me. And a client RPC works the other way around, so a server can run some code on a client. This is going to help us with damaging the enemies so that a user can say, hey, I want to try to damage some enemies in this area. Then the server will do some raycast, check if there are any enemies. It is going to subtract their health. Currently in the player, we are running all of the attack logic in here. So what we'll want to do is that on the user, we still need to check for the input. We can't just run all of this as a server RPC because a server can't really check if this user clicked with the left mouse button. So on the client, we'll still need to check if we are pressing the left mouse button. If this is true, then we'll tell the server that we want to run all of this logic on the server. Creating server and client RPCs is really simple. You can just create new void. And the important thing is that at the end of the name of the function, you have either server RPC or client RPC. And then everything in here works as a normal function, it is just running on the server and we also need to give it attribute server RPC. So even though the code is located on a client, it is going to run on the server. For simplicity, I will be running just this part of the code on the server, so I won't be running the animations there, as well as the attack cooldown, but for competitive games you can certainly make it like this. So if we can attack, I will just take this part, which is doing some circle cast, and it is checking if we found any enemies, if we did, it is just going to damage them. So I will take this part and I will just paste it into the server RPC. And then when we should run this part, I will just call the server RPC. It is really that simple. Even though it is not giving us any errors right now, it would not be working because there is no way that the server RPC can access the current move direction. So we can just pass this in as a parameter. So we have it as a parameter. And when calling the function, we can just input it. So I'm playing as the host, we can try damaging some enemies. It's going to take a while and we can see the enemy died. Now when I go to the client, start as a client, walk to some enemies. Again, it is going to take some time to damage them, but we can see that they are dead. So now we are making our game a lot safer against cheaters because we are running more and more code on the server. Another useful thing to know about are server RPC params. 
which you can pass in into those server RPCs or client RPCs. It always has to be as the last parameter and it is just called server RPC params. It looks a bit crazy when creating the RPC params because you can see that they contain some receive params as well as some send params and in the receive params you can for example specify ID of the client sender and stuff like that. So if you would want to use the client RPC, call it from the server, then you can actually specify on which clients you want to call it, but we don't really need this now. Next, we'll take a look at how we can make our own network variables that we are going to share across the network. We'll use this for the player score, so currently each of the players will be just displaying their own score, but what we could do later is that we'll have some leaderboard and we could just display scores of all of the players. Creating a network variable is quite simple. You can just type network variable, then input which type you want to use. You can also create your own, but I won't be covering this in this video. So for the score, we can just have an integer, call it player score, and you also need to initialize it. Just like that, pretty simple. To get or set the value of the variable is a bit different. So in here, when we are increasing the player score, instead of increasing it directly, we need to access the value, and then we can do anything we want with it. Now we should be correctly setting the player value, and I will also make sure that it is displaying on the player UI. Useful thing about network variables is that they also have a callback when the value has changed. So in here I just made a function that is going to be called once the value of the variable has changed. So we can just then set the score text. And back in the player, on the start, we can just assign the callback to that function. So we have the network variable, player score. I am accessing the callback on value changed and I'm just assigning the update score UI function that is on the player UI object. Now we are at the host, try killing some enemies. Yep, we can see the score increase to one, to two. Now we can go to the other client and see what is going to happen there. So kill some enemies. Yep, we are on one, two, and you can see that each player is displaying their own score. We could obviously do this even without network variables, we can just store the data locally, but let's say at the end of the game, we could just display scores of all of the players. And the last thing we'll take a look at is how to make a server authoritative movement, which will probably be most useful for you. But creating it is really nothing different than just using a server RPC. So in the player script, we can just create a RPC to move, which is going to run all of the code on the server. So we can just take all of this code that we have in the move function, but we still need to keep the input in. We can put it to the move server RPC. And even though it is giving us just one error with the movement direction, we will also need to pass in the movement speed base as well as the movement speed multiplier through parameters. So in the move function, after we have calculated the direction, we can just call the server RPC and pass in all of the parameters. And you can notice that we are also using the animator and the RB, so we could also pass these as parameters or just get them in. So just like this, I'm also accessing the components. So this way, all of the calculations related to the movement are happening on the server. The cheaters could still pretty much change the movement direction, the movement speed base or the movement speed multiplier, but this truly is a server authoritative movement. So movement for the host is working well as usual and for the client, we are not able to move. Why is that? Because the calculations are happening on the server, our players are still using the client network transform. And if you remember, this one is only client authoritative, so we can just remove it and put the network transform component instead of this one. So now, as the player is using the network transform, only the server can change its position, and for the cheaters it should be at least a bit harder. And because I put all of the code into the server RPC, including the animations, we can also remove the client network animator and add in just classic network animator and assign the animator. So the host can move as usual and the client should also be able to work anywhere he wants. You can see that there is quite a bit of delay, so if I'm moving and I stop, the movement is still going for quite some time. This is one of the issues with server authoritative movement, that there is going to be some delay, but there are many ways that we can fake the movement or we can just do some predictions and stuff like that, that should help us to get rid of the delay. And because right now we are running the game locally, the delay is pretty much zero, so if you want to test how it would look like on a network, you can also set some delay in the network manager, so we can give it few milliseconds, and I will try moving. Yeah, now it is working quite fine, so maybe we can give it like 
100 and we will see. And yeah, now we can see that the delay is being quite bad. Another thing that I want to mention is that this multiplayer that we have made right now is going to work only on the local network. So you can just input your IP address and you can connect from a different computer on the same network. If you want to be able to play the game with your other friends from all over the world, we can use the Unity servers, which is what the next video will be about. I hope that this tutorial was useful, don't forget to check out my Patreon, Discord server. If you have any questions or suggestions, drop them down to the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe and I will see you in next videos. Bye! Thanks for watching this video till the end. If you are looking for a Unity, C Sharp or Bolt tutor, then I am here for you, so feel free to send me a message to my Gmail and take a look at my website for more info. I can help you with your personal projects or teach you anything about game development you would want to know. You are welcome.